Um, I'll slowly get started here with the welcome. Um, but first, I just wanted to check here in that we have uh, that we are recording. Yes, indeed. Perfect. All right. As the last few uh, participants log in, um, I'll just uh, give this brief welcome address. Hello, everyone. My name is Oliver Kirsebaum, and I'm the senior staff scientist on the Meridian Project. And on behalf of the Meridian team, I'd like to welcome you to the sixth and next to last uh, webinar in a series of seven webinars that we have been hosting this winter. Meridian is a three-year project funded by the Canada Foundation for Innovation, uh, and we also receive support from the member universities, which include Dalhousie University, Université de Québec, SFU, UBC, and UVic, and uh, industry partners, notably JASCO and Exactor. Um, this webinar series in particular is funded by a grant from uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada under the Ocean and Freshwater Science Contribution Program. And also uh, at this point, I'd like to thank uh, Pisces Research Project Management uh, for their help with preparing and uh, running these webinars. At Meridian, our mandate uh, for the past few years has been to support uh, the ocean research com community through um, the creation of software tools for managing, analyzing, uh, visualizing underwater acoustics data in particular. And so as part of this webinar series, uh, we are also showcasing some of the tools uh, that we've developed in the last few years. Today's webinar uh, focuses on sharing of data in research. As we all know, having access to the right data is essential uh, to solving scientific problems. However, the data and the methods of retrieval both change over time due to new research directions, new use cases, and technological advancements. So in this webinar, we will examine data and metadata management, theory and practice through different phases of the life cycle of research projects, from devising a metadata profile to public release and maintaining and upgrading legacy systems. There will be four presentations today, uh, which will discuss some of the approaches taken uh, and challenges faced and lessons learned in the development of the Meridian Discovery Portal and its accompanying metadata profile, the FISH-based global uh, information system, and the Federated Research, Research Data Repository, uh, also known as FRDR or further. Each of these presentations will be followed by an audience uh, question period uh, and following the four presentations, uh, the presenters will tackle uh, deeper questions during a collaborative panel. We have uh, the four speakers today, two of them from Meridian, Kim Mortimer and Sarah Vela. And then we have with us from um, the Portage Network, Kelly Stathis, uh, Discovery and Metadata Coordinator at Portage Network. And finally, we have uh, Dr. Nicholas Bailey, uh, who, um, among other things, is the curatorial assistant at the Fishes Collection at the Beatty Biodiversity Museum uh, in uh, Vancouver, BC. So, um, before we get underway, uh, I just wanted to uh, let you all know that the webinar is being recorded and the video will be made available through Meridian's YouTube channel uh, within the next week or so. And uh, in this YouTube channel, you can also find recordings of the previous five webinars we've had at this point, as well as older webinars that we had uh, uh, last year. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me pass the mic to you, Kim, um, for the first presentation of this webinar. Great. Thanks very much, Oliver. <clears throat> let me just see. I'm going to stop your screen sharing. Yep. And just slightly adjust that. <clears throat> and I think I should have started my video. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't want to turn on my webcam. <laughs> uh, one of these buttons is going to open up things. Anyways, that's probably good enough. So thanks, everyone, for coming today. 
Um, I'm going to start things off by talking about the design and introduction of data discovery at Meridian. So I'm going to talk a little bit about metadata just to make sure everyone's on the same page. I know some of you are probably experts. Maybe some of you are really new to this. Um, and then getting into the Meridian metadata profile, which we use to support our discovery portal on the back end. And I'll talk more about that as we get into things. For people who haven't heard about metadata before, metadata is for describing things. Usually we think about data when we talk about metadata, but a lot of different things have metadata and there are lots of different things that are metadata. For thinking about your computer files, things that are data, there are some pretty obvious things that are metadata. Your title, when you made it, when it was last edited, but also think about things like your file size, the format, what program opens it, what program created it. These things are also metadata in some ways. I suspect it's probably been a while since a lot of you have been in a library. I know it has been for me, but library catalogs are metadata catalogs when you get down to it. Um, a store host for metadata, basically. Obviously, they were physical, now they're digital. The core idea is still the same. So there's a lot of historical debt there in terms of metadata theory and practice. I think one element that people overlook, especially when talking about metadata at a very early stage, is that the purpose, the purpose and audience matter when you are choosing and describing your metadata. The metadata you use for an academic journal is probably going to be slightly different in terms of what you present, what you highlight, what is high priority, what is low priority, when you compare that with a children's book, even if they're stored in the same library. Likewise, what a librarian considers useful is going to be different from that of a reader. The last thing I want to start think people to start thinking about is the structure. When you store metadata in the same way each time, when you make it consistent, you can compare things a lot more easily. For example, you probably all run into issues with how people write dates. You can even see a little date at the bottom of my presentation here. And you know, 2021-01-20. That's ISO 8601, which is just some jargon for you. Um, but other people will write it, you know, January 20th or Jan 20, 2021. Obviously, if you put that into a big Excel spreadsheet or your computer program, it's going to be hard to sort by date if everyone writes in a different way. That's the sort of thing we're thinking about with structure. When we go a little bit deeper into that intersection of audience purpose and structure, we realize that sort of defines the understanding of metadata and the metadata that you have to use in your project. A public library is going to be different from an archive in terms of its metadata because the purpose of a library and archive are different, but also the form will probably be different as well just because they have different systems, slightly different expertise, different things they consider relevant. Um, relevance depends on your audience, right? In my opinion, this is one of the hardest things about describe, designing a metadata system because you're trying to anticipate what your users will want from and intend to do with your product, which probably is still in development at this point and has no real users. You can try and take a really broad view of what you think is needed, but then you might have more work to do. So I say here, when metadata structures are widely adopted, it allows interoperability and expand searches. So I mentioned about dates. When everyone writes dates the same way, you can put all those dates into one big database and search them, or sort them, or find everything that was made in February. Um, so interoperability in this case, I specifically am referring to the ability for one service to index all these multiple things, um, reducing the number of stops a place has to go to find a given data set. Um, so I have this picture of a shipping container here, or well, a ship with a bunch of shipping containers on it. If every shipping container was differently sized, had different dimensions, different shapes, everything, you couldn't fit the, as many onto a given ship. It would be like playing you know, Tetris. Um, you'd have to worry about balance and stability since all of them would have different weights and densities. It would just be a complete pain. Instead, they all have the same size, the same weight, the same form, more or less, plus whatever is in them, of course. And that, in turn, lets us move hundreds or thousands of them in one ship. 
Now, if you're an established in an established discipline with lots of existing shared data, you're probably going to be forced to provide metadata that matches theirs, the stuff that already exists. And you can see in this way that different structures become more dominant over time in a given field. As soon as one metadata structure catches on, everyone else kind of starts using it in order so that it's more interoperable, so that they can find more things so that people don't have to go to all different sites. You can always try to shake things up, provide more or different metadata or do it in a different way, but there's always that risk that people won't find it or you'll just be ignored. But when you make bigger and bigger groups, all of a sudden people will have to pay attention to you if you make those decisions. And then at that point, they are accepted at some point. They become their own structure that becomes separate from the existing one. And now we get into the real jargony slide here. This is just one sort of terminology and jargon that I prefer. If you refer to other sources or experts or books, you know, they'll probably refer to similar or the same concepts and but possibly in different ways. On the right, we have this sort of ring structure where I'm moving from more abstract on the outside to more applied on the inside. So standards are generally abstract. They may be produced by giant organizations. For example, the International Organization for Standardization makes a lot of them, but they might be a little abstract. They might lack precise rules. Then you get these profiles, which is when you get generally big groups that take the standard and say, we like this, but we need it to do specific things for us. So they will make some modifications, some little changes, and generally they have enough reach that these can catch on. For example, there, for ISO 19105, which is what I'll talk about later, um, that's International Organization for Standardization, number 19115, but there's a North American profile, there's an Australia, New Zealand profile, there's European profiles. All of these are separate objects that take the same standard and interpret it slightly differently. Schemas are the dictionary or the language of metadata, how you write it down. So a given standard or profile might have multiple schemas, depending on what it's supposed to be written down as. One example here is Darwin Core, which again, I'll talk about later, hence why I'm talking about it. Um, it has at least three schemas. And then there's the implementation, which uh, Kelly, Sarah, and Dr. Bailey will be talking about later. Um, which might require you to go back and revise the schema, might interpret the schema in different ways in order to make it easier to understand or develop. And that in turn, you know, changes how users experience and interact with your program. So here's a sort of hypothetical example of how metadata rules go from a standard into an implementation. This is again sort of borrowed from ISO 1915, but it's not real. This is invalid code or anything. So we have a standard which is, you know, it gives a rule. You have to have a title. It doesn't really tell you where, and it doesn't really tell you, you know, you could probably have a dozen titles if you'd interpret it loosely. But then you get into a schema which says, you know, okay, don't repeat it. There's only one title or a profile. Then there's a schema. In this case, it's pseudo XML, extended markup language, that writes the element, it's metadata for a data set, which has an element called title. It has to occur once, it can only occur once. And then we get to a web form where people are entering a title. So in this way, you sort of get an evolution from three data practice. On this slide, I wanna showcase our, some of our decision-making processes and user experiences we tried to incorporate when developing our metadata system. We had some idea of what the audience might be based on existing repositories. We also had our initial grant proposal that told us we wanted to appeal to researchers, scientists, programmers, decision-makers, the public. But at that point, we were appealing to a whole lot of people. So we ended up going for trying to go simple to reduce the risk of misinterpretation or alienation. 
since researchers and scientists and programmers and all that stuff have different backgrounds and different experiences that they're bringing to the table. Our purpose was laid out in our proposal as well. We're storing metadata and not data. Um, we didn't have a lot of restrictions on the types of data we wanted to describe though. We wanted to describe data, we wanted to describe software, we wanted to describe models, really just that it related to an ocean researcher research in some way. So it needed to be robust to accept lots of different inputs about things. The structure was defined by our need to be interoperable and open source. We're not in a brand new field here. There are existing competitors, just some that weren't as well focused to the audience and purpose that we were, let alone in Canada. Since we were working with Ocean, Ocean Researcher, we ended up referring to existing ocean metadata systems like the Marine Community Profile or Sea Data Net, which were predominantly, not exclusively, ISO 19115 profiles. So we stuck with that and used an existing tool to work with ISO 19115 profiles to be a cloud compatible foundation, to use an existing system, and all the geo network was open source, so it suited our needs quite well. So starting with ISO 19115, the very first draft of Meridian's metadata system looked something like this. We had ISO 19115-2, which is an extension to include instruments, platforms, and operations, which we thought could be relevant since we knew there was glider research, research vessels that were doing marine research that we were interested in. We had used the 2009 edition, which, yeah, 2009 is a long time ago now. The International Organization for Standardization does revise their standards over time. The Next scheduled re revision was due in 2019, but we started this work in 2018 and it wasn't out yet, so we're kind of stuck with the old version right now. With the profile, since we're Canadian, we started with the North American profile. And I used the NOAA North American or Northern Ocean Amer Aeronautics Administration uh, profile guide to mostly help me out there. And the schema, we used XML because that worked with G-Network, which is described in the ISO 191139 standard. But at this point, there was a problem. ISO 191105 is predominantly for geographic data, but there's no real way to record structured information about biological species. We knew that one of our major use cases was going to be people describing audio recordings use, collect it using hydrophones, collect it with um, sonar, that sort of thing. And in that case, we wanted to know what animals were in a given recording, North Atlantic right whales, dolphins, whatever. And keeping that in a structured way so people, people would be able to search for it and say, I want to find all data sets that include dolphins or whales or whatever would be really hard. We considered a ISO 1105 biological extension, but it wasn't really widely adopted or supported in any way. It would be about as hard to implement as any other decision we made. So we went a different and interesting path. On the other side, so starting from the biological perspective, we went with Darwin Core, which is pretty much an exclusively biological metadata standard based on Dublin Core with a lot of extensions. In, and since it's biological information, but not really dependent on the way it was collected, acoustic biological information was feasible. Unfortunately, Darwin Core wasn't as widely used in collecting ocean research, except for OBIS, the Ocean Biogeographic Information System. Um, which is obviously huge, so that was a benefit. And conveniently, there is a Darwin Core XML schema. So why not shove them in together? Well, there's one little problem with that XML schema is that it's not quite as popular as alternative versions. Uh, Obis uses a star schema uh, in which multiple files are linked together from a central one, uh, hence a star with connections radiating outwards. XML is a big single document and 
therefore it's not very convenient or easy to split that up into multiple files. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but it was a compromise made to get the next step, which is essentially shoving Darren Core into ISO 1 and 115 using XML. So in this case, you can see there's ISO 1 and 5-2 containing Darren Core, the variant of the NOAA uh, profile with some added Darren Core elements, and ISO 1 and 1 through 9 with the Darwin Core XML inside it using a custom namespace. Because ISO 1 and 1 and 5 2 and ISO 1 and 1 through 9 2 don't have Darwin Core elements in them natively, uh, I needed to define a new set of elements that could contain them. You can think of the result as a Darwin Core file nested inside an ISO 19115 file with all the support needed to keep that from being rejected like an organ transplant, basically. So essentially, I've shoved a, uh, a complete other set of organs into the uh, existing system of ISO 1915, and then given it a lot of uh, anti-rejection drugs. There are some benefits and some drawbacks to this, which you've probably heard a little bit of already, or have some ideas in your head. It's compatible with a lot of existing things like GeoNetwork because it uses XML and the existing ISO 1915 standard. Um, that makes it really easy to compare files, at least visually and also programmatically to some degree, um, because you could even just line them up side by side. But because we had to do the namespace change in order to fit the Darwin core elements inside, the result is that you still have to translate them between the two if you want to really do algorithmic comparisons. Um, essentially, it's as if I was told that I was working with a docx file, but really it's a text file underneath. So it needs some translation to handle all the formatting, essentially. <clears throat> and because we have the Darwin Core element shoved in, if you wanted to put it into an ISO 1.05 system, you have to discard those. We made it generic to suit our purpose and audience. And But we also tried to zoom in on our purpose, the oceans and acoustics uh, specificity, and also to support software and data, which means that there are conditional statements and some exceptions in our implementation. Um, that in turn makes it somewhat more complicated for someone to understand, let alone program. The main benefit is the fact that we do have all that Darwin Core data. In fact, you know, we can just put that entire Darwin Core XML file inside, which is great until we need to put it into another system. So putting into ISO 115, we can either just discard it entirely, which would suck because then people would have provided metadata that isn't being used in this alternative system, or it can lose the structure. We can put it into a, a flat text, basically, which isn't great but it preserves the data at least. And I also mentioned the star schema for OBIS. Um, it's almost impossible to make that algorithmically. And there's assumptions in how the XML is generated about what the star will look like, in turn meaning it's not as flexible as OBIS could be. In terms of what is left to do and what we want to do next, I did mention there was a update to ISO 19115-2 in 2019, which was pretty big. 10 years of updates is uh, a lot to catch up on, and it'd be great to get us up to date with that. Darwin Core is continuously updated, so the inserted elements there would also have to be maintained with time. <clears throat> we are really interested in building crosswalks to link our metadata into other repositories, such as Furter, or the CUS uh, Canadian Integrated Ocean Observing System metadata repository that are in that's in development. You'll hear more about crosswalking from Kelly. Um, we're also always looking for feedback on the profile, our implementation, uh, the schema we used. And since we're about to be revising it to update ISO 115, if people have feedback or are interested in providing feedback, now would be a great time. Um, I do want to specifically thank the CU's metadata team for having already looked at and provided feedback for our profile. 
that was excellent and wonderful. The final thing is we do, did use a geo network deployment as the metadata repository, but we moved over to a MongoDB instance, which stores the metadata in JSON and then exports it to XML. Um, we used geo network because it was open source, supported everything supposedly. I did have to do a lot of work in the guts to get it to support everything I added. Um, and it has existing APIs for interfacing with other systems. MongoDB was a lot more flexible in terms of what we could do with it and a little easier to reach into the guts and rearrange things. But we do have to develop uh, APIs, application platform interfaces, in order to uh, network the MongoDB into other systems. And then we could retire GeoNetwork. So hopefully this presentation helps you understand the Meridian profile a little bit better and understand why Meridian and I made the choices we did for our metadata. Um, we were trying to meet our audience, our purpose, and use existing structures. The modifications we did make obviously have benefits and drawbacks to both, some of which I've tried to make obvious during this, and I'm sure some of you probably have other ideas that I'm sure you can share with me. Beyond updating our profile, we need to invest in crosswalks to interlink our metadata to preserve Meridian in the event we cease to function, exist, or get funding, and also advertising us on bigger or higher profile services. For anyone who's interested in getting more into the technical details, uh, you can view our full metadata documentation on our website. Um, you can also download our GeoNetwork plugin as an open source code, which has the XML schema in it, if you are interested in that as well. And I'm also happy to answer questions at k.mortimer at dal.ca. Thanks very much for your time. I'm open to answer relevant questions now and bigger ones during the uh, panel later. I think you Thank can you, ask questions in the chat or ask to be unmuted. Yeah, yeah, I think I believe people can ask questions uh, either way, either by unmuting themselves or by uh, just typing them into the chat. Um, and you're also welcome to use the chat for other purposes, not just asking questions, but uh, feel free to to comment on, uh, on, on other people's questions through the chat. Kim, I, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, so um, thank you again. Uh, I think we'll just jump to the next presentation. Yep, that um, works for me. And if people have thought of any questions by the time of the panel, I'd be happy to answer them then or by email if uh, that's inconvenient. Thanks, everyone. So up next is uh, Kelly, uh, Kelly Stathis from uh, Further. Um, and uh, Kelly, feel free to share your screen, see if we can get your presentation up. One second, uh, let me share this one. Make that bigger. All right, can you see that okay? Yep, perfect. Okay, great, thanks. All right, hi everyone. Um, so thanks for having me here at the workshop today. My name is Kelly Stathis and I am the Discovery and Metadata Coordinator for the Portage Network. Um, and I'm here to give an overview of the further discovery service. So what it is, how it benefits researchers, and how it's working to bring together metadata from different repositories into a single search platform. And just before I get started, I want to apologize in advance for any construction noise. There's some, some drilling going on in my building, so if you hear a very loud noise suddenly, that's what's going on. So just an overview of what I'll talk about today. First, I will give a brief overview of the several different services that are offered by the Federated Research Data Repository, or FERDER as we call it. And then we'll go into the specifically the further discovery service in depth, including the benefits of the service, who our collaborating repositories are, and the text space and geospatial discovery interfaces. And then we'll go and deeper dive into how further is actually working behind the scenes, including how the metadata harvester works, the further metadata profile, and how we use metadata crosswalks to reconcile all these different schemas. 
So FRITR is a scalable federated platform for research data management and the discovery of Canadian research data. And we're a collaboration between the Canadian Association of Research Libraries Portage Network, where I work, and Compute Canada. FRITR has three main components. There's the national discovery layer or the discovery service. That's a federated search tool, which is providing a single point of search for discovery and access of Canadian research data. There's the data repository component, um, which is accompanied by a dedicated curation support. And there's the preservation pipeline, which is connecting to the data repository to provide preservation processing and long-term preservation storage. And for today, I'll just be focusing on the national discovery layer. So the further discovery service provides functionality to discover data sets that exist in Canadian research data repositories from any discipline. So essentially we're harvesting metadata from multiple repository platforms and we expose that metadata via a single point of search like a centralized metadata catalog. Currently we include over 120,000 data sets and we're aggregating from over 70 repositories. And there are a few components to this part of the platform. So first there's the metadata harvester itself which is a Python script that's harvesting metadata from different repositories. It crosswalks or maps that metadata to the further profile, writes it to a database, and then exports from the database in a format that's suitable for indexing. And there's our search functionality, which is built on Globus Search, which is very similar to Elasticsearch. And our discovery interface itself, which um, this is based on UBC Libraries Open Collections interface. So FRITER's national discovery layer has several benefits for researchers. First, um, FRITER improves discovery of Canadian research data by making metadata discoverable in that single search interface. And as I mentioned, we've developed this custom harvester to work with different platforms and standards. So we're aggregating metadata from different repositories. This in turn helps to break down repository silos. So instead of having to search multiple locations, a researcher can use FRITER to search across all the different repositories we harvest. Fritter also benefits existing repository sites by driving traffic back to them, since each search result in Fritter is linking back to the original data source. And then finally, we're able to use the index we've created to provide an OAI PMH metadata feed to other aggregators. So Fritter's metadata is now included in the Open Air Research Graph, um, and that's an EU initiative that's one of the largest open access collections of research outputs. And we also provide a feed to the data citation index. So any um, that was part of the web of science. So anything that's indexed by further is also available through web of science. And we're also working to really soon have further speed available through the ProQuest Central Discovery Index, which is convenient for libraries who are using um, Summon, Primo, or Alma um, to easily add further speed to their institution's discovery service. So you can basically search further alongside searching the main catalog. So here's a brief overview of what data is discoverable in FURTER. So currently we've got over 70 research data repositories harvested, um, and these include university repositories, government repositories, various domain-specific repositories, as well as the data sets that are directly deposited in FURTER's own repository service that I mentioned at the beginning. So to give a few examples here, um, for university data repositories, we include all scholars portal data verses, um, as well as some institutional repositories. And for institutional repositories, those often include a mix of data sets, publications, other resources. So an example of that would be UBC Circle. And we just filter out the data sets only for inclusion in further. We also harvest government repositories, including the federal open government portal, um, most provincial data portals, and a growing number of local and municipal data portals. The domain-specific repositories in FURTER include ones from several research centers, so that includes DataStream and CUSE. And finally, we have over 150 data sets um, that are deposited directly in FURTER's own repository, and those can be found via the discovery interface. So all these are searchable using our main text-based discovery interface, and this is allowing for basic keyword searching and supports both English and French. Um, there's also some advanced searching you can do using a syntax that is very similar to Elasticsearch. And you can filter results by different metadata elements, including the date, author, and the source repository in the site. And then when you click on show details, the harvested metadata for each result can be previewed, and then each result, um, the title links back to the source repository's dataset landing page, where you might find more complete metadata and be able to download the dataset. 
Um, Ferner is also working on developing features for geospatial data discovery. We host the Geodesy platform for map-based search, which was initially developed at UBC and is based on the GeoBlocklight platform. And Geodesy makes data sets with geospatial information available via this map-based search. And the platform works with geospatial metadata as well as any data sets that contain geospatial files. So in order to attribute a location to a data set, it will first use any explicit coordinates in the data sets metadata and files. So that could be a bounding box or a shape file that it can download and process. And then for repositories that have robust place name metadata, Geodesy can, um, sorry, it can also analyze the place names and query um, a service called GeoNames to retrieve the corresponding coordinates based on the place name. So even if that data set doesn't have any explicit coordinates in the metadata, it can attribute a bounty box and be findable on the map. So in order to search, users can use the map to create a bounding box, and then they can retrieve data sets that have coordinates within the selected location. Initially, Geodesy was built to connect to data risk repositories, and the beta phase of the project was connecting to um, the repositories and scholars of Portal Dataverse. And at this time, we're nearly finished connecting Geodesy directly to the Furter Harvesters database. So then it will include records from all the repositories harvested by Furter with geospatial information. And we are also currently working on a larger interface redesign plan that would more fully integrate the Geodesy and Furter search platforms, which will allow users to transition a little bit more seamlessly between text and geospatial search. So now I'd like to talk a little bit more about how the metadata harvester works on the back end to populate these results in further. So basically we've developed a separate harvester for each protocol or API type. So for example, we've got one for OAIPMH, um, one for the Dataverse API, one for the CCAN API, and so on. And each harvester will deal with the specifics for that repository type, which includes crosswalking the source metadata to the further metadata profile, which I'll cover more on the next few slides. So when we add a new repository, we first do an initial harvest to get all records and metadata. The harvester writes the record metadata to our database and then exports metadata in the JSON format that's used by our global search for indexing. And then after that initial harvest, we will do periodic reharvests of each repository to get any new records. So we fetch new records every seven days and then each existing record will be refreshed every 30 days. So if there's any changes to the metadata, we'll pick that up frequency. The harvester stores metadata according to the, the, the further metadata profile that we've developed. And it's very generalist and contains elements based on the Dublin Core and dataset metadata standards, along with several custom elements that we've added in. So you can see the list of elements on this slide. Um, most of them are coming from J Dublin Core. So title, author, description, series, you see a lot of familiar elements there. And then we also have a few that are borrowed from data site. So for example, author affiliation and the type or resource type general field where we're using their controlled vocabulary. There's also the handful of custom elements. So that includes the access field, which is whether the data set is openly available or restricted, and then the URL for the data set. So of course, the repositories we harvest don't all use the same set of elements as further. They all have their own profiles structures. So we're having to transform the metadata from each source repository to fit into the further metadata profile. And this process is called developing a metadata crosswalk or a mapping from one metadata standard to another. And there are several types of mappings that can occur that we use for further. Um, the simplest mapping is one-to-one -one, in which a field is copied into a directly equivalent field. So this could be mapping a repository's creator field to our author field, or mapping an abstract field to description field. The, the value of the field could be copied over exactly, or in some cases there could be some small changes. Another type of mapping is many to one in which we would combine several fields from the source into a single field in the metadata profile. So one example we have a, a few times referred to is where a repository will have a separate license name and license URL field, and then we'll merge those into a single rights field. Or there could also be several different fields that are for different specific types of contributors, and we will just combine those into our general contributor field. The next type of mapping is one to none, which is actually the most common type of mapping that we'll use where we're discarding a metadata field entirely. So further is for 
um, across all disciplines, and so it has to have a general profile. But for many disciplinary repositories, there's tons of metadata fields that just don't have an equivalent in the further generalist schema. For example, like a field for species name or any of the other biological fields that Kim was mentioning. And then finally, there are a few cases in which we supply some metadata ourselves, which we would call a none to one mapping. And so this supplied metadata would always be very generic, such as introducing the type data set to describe um, records that are data sets. We won't supply anything that's specific to a data set. Like, you know, it's, it's only across all records that we would really be doing this. So here's an example of a crosswalk from um, Canada's open government portal metadata to the further metadata profile. And this will spend the next couple of slides. And just to know, I'm not showing all of the fields here, just a few representative examples for the different types of mappings. So for many fields, there's just a one-to-one -one match where the field contents are copied over exactly. So here we've got the title and description in English and France, French, um, which are title translated and notes translated in the source metadata. We also map the organization's title from the source metadata to our author field, since this is the, the institutional author of the data set and there isn't a field for um, individual authors in this case. There are also some fields where the metadata is transformed in a small way. So the first few examples here, there's still one-to-one -one mappings, but there is that transformation. So the date publish field for the open government portal gives a full timestamp, although perhaps not an accurate one with the, the midnight timestamp, but we're just cutting this down to the, the year, month, and day for our date field. We also have to transform the ID field here in order to construct the item URL, which includes that ID at the end of it. Um, there's no full URL in the source metadata, so we're using the, the pattern to construct this. Um, another example where we're changing a value is where we're saying here, um, if it's false that the data set is private, then that's equivalent to the access being public, which is the term that we're using for consistency in further. And then next we have the, the money to one mapping that I mentioned. So here is combining that license title and license URL into a single rights field. And then there's a, the none to one supply mapping where we're adding the type data set to the record. And then finally, there are many fields in the original metadata record that we just don't crosswalk to the further metadata profile. So in this case, there was a maintainer email address, um, a frequency, a jurisdiction. Since this is a government repository, they're saying this is a federal data set. And there's a date that the metadata itself was created. We don't have a place for these in the further metadata profile, and so they're just not included. And the contents of these fields wouldn't be searchable in further. So to summarize, there are several key impacts of crosswalking. The main benefit of cross molecular harvesting metadata is that further users can search across Canadian research data repositories using a consistent metadata profile. In order to accomplish this, each source repository's metadata schema is reconciled to the set of core general elements which are useful for data discovery. Essentially, we're creating a, one structure that can be used to search across all of these very different structures. However, we don't store all the source metadata in further records. So any element that doesn't fit into FURTER's generalist metadata profile is discarded, such as discipline-specific metadata. Um, and so that's because we're serving our general audience for FURTER. Um, but in order to access the metadata, users can always click on the result in FURTER and lead to the source repository's landing page, which then also can prompt them to do a search in that repository where it might have more specific elements that are for their needs. So that's what I got for today. Thanks for having me. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge the Canadian New Digital Research Infrastructure Organization, NGO, for their funding, um, as long as, as, along with the other partners shown on this slide who are really instrumental in working with Partage and Furrier. And thanks, happy to take any questions. Thanks, Kelly. So um, again, if you have questions for, for Kelly, um, you're welcome to unmute yourself or uh, use the chat. And of course, we'll have opportunity for uh, more in-depth um, discussions, uh, more um, detailed questions uh, at the end of this webinar for the panel discussion at the end.
Kelly, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, so let me just thank you again for uh, the presentation um, and for uh, representing further and, and helping us put together this webinar. Um, we are now, um, we're a little early on schedule, which is not a problem. I think I'll just, uh, the next uh, item up on the agenda is a short break. So um, I'm just gonna send everyone on an early break here, uh, a 10 minute break. And, uh, and then we'll uh, reconvene here in uh, um, a little over 10 minutes to make things uh, simple. I suggest that we reconvene here at uh, on the hour, uh, which is 3 p.m. here in uh, Halifax. Um, so in, in, in 13 minutes from now. Um, and so we'll reconvene here uh, and um, the first presentation after the break will be given by Sarah um, and her presentation is entitled From Theory to Practice. Oh, hang on. There's actually a question for you, Kelly, if you're still around. Sure. Yeah, I'm here. Um, yeah. Yes, they are um, both available now. Um, and I can put the link in the chat for both of those. Thanks. OK. Um, so break for the next a little over 10 minutes. Um, if you have more questions, then feel free to uh, add them to the chat. We'll come back to them later. Either uh, we'll address them uh, just through the chat in the break, or we can come back to them at the end of the webinar as part of the panel discussion. All right. All right. Um. Uh, the one thing I did want to note before we got started, because I think Oliver kind of overlooked it, is do you have the link to the YouTube channel handy, Kim? And can you drop that in the chat? Yep. Give me a sec. Thank you. you referenced that, but if anybody wanted to find it, it's not all that easy to search for right now. Um, all right. So I am going to kind of pick up the story... Um, where, where we left off in the first half. So we've kind of seen a bit of an explanation of, of what metadata schemas are and how they come together and an example of how they're used. Uh, and now I wanna dig in a little bit to what do, you, what do you sort of do with them? How do you take them from these, you know, different forms of written or XML or, or various documents into an actual functioning tool of some sort that's collecting or storing data? Uh, or making it available in some way. So we are gonna walk through that. I'm gonna do that um, in a couple of steps. So I'm gonna be using as an example case, the work that we've been doing at Meridian. So it's going to be referencing the metadata schema that Kim um, was explaining in the first half and the sort of data discovery tool that we've built from that. But um, these really are just example cases uh, I feel like what we're covering for the bulk of this is something that is applicable to any project and that uh, I hope, you know, people can walk away from or we can get a discussion around um, sort of how these things work. Um, so I'm going to introduce those cases very briefly just so you are to sort of understand where some of the pictures I'm using are coming from. Um, we're going to go over some of my philosophy around um, schemas and, and developing tools and how that works. Uh, I've labeled this as some thoughts because you're not going to see a lot of, uh, uh, or really any at all, uh, citations in this. It, it's just based on my experience and my observations and how I work. Uh, so there's, there's not a whole lot of guarantees attached to this beyond that. Um, and then once we, we kind of cover that background information, um, I want to get into the specifics of really how do you translate a schema? How do you take what the schema tells you and turn that into um, kind of a useful structure, both in the back end of a database and on the front end of, of a, like a web interface. Um, and out of that, I'm going to leave you with uh, a sort of table of, of what I stumbled into while making this presentation of a sort of recommended um, schema translation language of, of how you can kind of get the people who make schemas uh, talking better to the people who are developing things and how you can kind of 
make that translation a little bit easier. So diving right in. Do I have the ability to switch slides? There we go. Um, so the Meridian metadata profile, uh, I'm not gonna go into too much of the specifics of this. Kim kind of covered how it came to be at the website listed here. You can get this visual representation of the, the schema. Uh, we have a screenshot of that here. So uh, the only things I wanna take away from this because they're the only things of real use for, for this presentation and schemas are quite complicated is um, the, there's sort of this, this tree structure of how different uh, classes and elements fit together. Um, each of these classes and elephant, <laughs> elephants, each of these classes and elements uh, have what I've called here a requirement type. So in the legend, it's represented by the different colors. Uh, they're either mandatory and those things have to be included. They're optional and it's up to the user whether that piece of data is, is useful or not um, or relevant or not, and, uh, or they can be conditional where they may or may not be required given a stated condition attached to, to the thing. And we'll, we'll look at some examples of that as we go through the presentation. Um, and the other thing that this is telling you, and this is represented in the legend by the, the sort of different shades, um, is whether that object is repeatable. So whether it can appear more than once or it's non-repeatable, you can only have it a single time. And I think Kelly went over that a little bit. And again, we'll, we'll see it going forward if you don't understand exactly what I mean by that yet. Um, so that was the metadata profile that we sort of were starting with from this. And through a series of steps that I'm going to cut over and just jump to the end, here's what we ended up with. Uh, so this is the Meridian Discovery Portal and Submission Form. Um, it's a tool that we hope is going to support marine resource reuse uh, so that we can do better research without a bunch of duplication of effort in collecting data that already exists somewhere. Um, so we are in no way a data repository. I like to think of it as sort of a niche search engine, but unlike Google, where they get all their data through like web scraping and, and there's not a lot of human interaction involved, uh, all of our metadata that is powering this needs to come from human submissions. So people sitting down and filling out the form to describe the data that they have and where they can find it. Uh, at the moment, we accept these, these five types of resources. Um, if anybody happens to have data that they would like to contribute or, or software that you've made that you think might be relevant, uh, that you would like to sort of advertise, we are desperately seeking data. We would love to get people using this as we recently sort of launched the, the first non-beta version. Uh, and it is available to that link, but I don't want this to be an ad for it. So this is sort of the last you're gonna hear about that. Um, but as you're seeing pictures that sort of draw on these, these color schemes and look a little bit like this web form, this is where these are coming from. Okay. All right, so a little bit on my, my sort of philosophy going into problems like this or how I like to develop things. So I am a big proponent of metadata schemas, I think that they are really, really helpful to development, no matter what sort of development you're doing, the scale of it or, or the field. I think that if you have an understanding of the data you're going to be using in place first, you will prevent a lot of errors and having to go back and make things again. Uh, and you'll ensure that what you end up with is going to be as useful as it can be. It's gonna have, you know, it's not missing that one piece of data that would let you build an additional kind of piece of functionality in. Um, so I am, am a big, big fan of schemas. But schemas are a thing that often aren't made with developers involved in them. Um, they're usually made by either information specialists or subject domain experts or a mix of the two. So in our example, uh, Kim's background is in library and information studies and he worked with, sorry, they worked with um, several people but one of them was uh, Amelise, who is a, a bioacoustician um, who does you know, all of her research in that field. So, so she was a great resource for sort of bouncing questions off of and filling in some, some of that Darwin Core material. Um, what this means is that uh, schemas are kind of already very collaborative and heavily negotiated. Um, so by the time that a developer gets them, they're not looking for further input. They're, they're considered sort of locked down and this is something that's, that is here. Um, and that can be a little bit of a problem depending on how flexible that schema has been made and how many, uh, you know, 
how much leeway a developer has to sort of transform it into a project without it uh, breaking the schema so much that it, it really doesn't, isn't able to, to crosswalk or isn't able to, to get between systems anymore. Um, and that's sort of that third part is schemas really want to be blueprints. Um, they would love to be something where you take it and you just make it as it is and it's, you know, it's a blueprint. Um, but in the same way that an architect, um, is someone unmuted? We can get them into this one. Um, uh, in the same way that an architect would make a blueprint and hand it to an engineer who might look at it and go, okay, great, but where am I going to put the outlets? Uh, there are still decisions that need to be made as you're, as you're translating these things into an actual tool and who makes those decisions and how they get made are, are very important. Um, and part of, I think, the difference is if the thing that is given priority is the metadata schema, um, then it's coming, you're going to make decisions that are going to skew in one direction. And if the person who's making decisions are coming from the development side, you're going to make those decisions skewing in a different direction. Uh, and that's because of what I've described here as these competing priorities of those sort of two camps of people. Now, ideally everyone involved in the project, whether you're writing a metadata schema or you're developing a tool is thinking about all of the things on this page but it is about those when it comes down to it and you have to make a decision, which of these factors are you prioritizing? So in my experience, schema writers will tend to be thinking more about the data itself. So they're prioritizing, thing, prioritizing things like uh, interoperability. So are they going to be able to move the data between systems to uh, bring data in through an API and have it work perfectly with, with the new system and to export it out to other users later and have it all be as everyone expects. They're thinking about the data richness. Is all of the data that you can you could possibly need in there to make sure that like everything we want to get done is going to be able to get done? Uh, and the thing about data longevity, they're thinking about, okay, we're collecting a bunch of data here, but eventually the tool might shut down and we think the data is still going to be useful after that. So how do we make sure that maybe through bringing in a couple extra pieces of contextual data, uh, or, or putting a couple of other precautions in place, we make sure that even if the tool goes away, the data still makes sense and is still usable. Um, so they're really thinking, as I say, about the, the data first. Now, developers are prioritizing more the tool. They're thinking about that first, and they're thinking about things like user experience. Somebody's got to sit down and fill this form out. How do I make that be a, a good experience where someone wants to come back and give us more data and, and really use our tool as much as possible. Um, they're thinking about code maintenance. How do I try and minimize the number of bugs that I'm getting in my code? How do I make sure it's not falling over all the time uh, and we're having a lot of downtime as we need to get it back up? And they're thinking about reducing complexity. How do I make sure that we're not being inundated with questions from users and having a lot of places where the code is repeated and uh, it comes, becomes a little bit more kind of Frankenstein-like Rube Goldberg-like as it grows over time? Uh, where can you reuse pieces and things like that? Um, and those are a very different set of goals. And which of those you sort of want to lean towards is going to change a lot of what your end product ends up looking like. Um, but there is some overlap in the middle here, which is that I think no matter who you are, everybody wants to make sure that the data you're getting is good because otherwise it's not of use to anyone. And everyone wants to make sure that you're getting kind of as much data as you can, um, whether that means like a complete data set, if it's a data set that can be complete, or a quickly growing data set, if it's sort of a, a live, ever-changing thing. Um, and I think by kind of focusing on, on those two center parts, you can kind of make the right decisions as you try to negotiate the, the process of turning a schema into a tool. Uh, so last slide of my to cerebral philosophizing on this, I promise. Uh, that sort of leaves us with this. So if we, if we consider a schema, or sorry, a schema, uh, a spectrum uh, where the more data that you want, the more complexity you're gonna get. Um, and that complexity might go up very small amounts if it's, if it's a really simple data field, or it could go up by huge chunks if it's a really kind of complicated piece of data to, to represent. Um, but in general, the more data you have, the more complexity. Ideally, what you want to have happen here is 
that a schema will set a true sort of minimum set of data. What is the least amount of data that you can get away with before you're just not going to be able to use this tool to accomplish what you want to accomplish? And then you want a developer to sort of look at things and go, okay, what's the maximum amount of complexity that we can actually withstand in order to get this thing built in the amount of time that we have and to maintain it over time with our budget and our staff and those sorts of things. And in a perfect world, you sit down and as I've shown it here, the schema sort of sets a minimum data that, that pushes more towards the left and the developer says, here's our maximum complexity and that pushes more towards the right. And then you get to have a lovely conversation about that balance design in the middle of, well, what do we want to add? Like we can, we can take on a little bit more than this. What do we want to add in there on top of the minimum? In reality, you're going to find that often this is flipped where the minimum amount of data that a schema says you want is more complex than what a developer thinks that, that the team can manage. Uh, and the arguments or discussions that you're having at that point are more about, okay, what can we cut without breaking everything? Um, and those are less fun. But I think at the end of the day, the, the sort of general philosophy of what you're trying to get stands. And this is sort of how I've gone into the next slides of what I'm thinking about when I'm trying to translate a schema into uh, a sort of a tool or, or development project. All right, so just a reminder of what it is that we're taking out of the schemas. That's sort of the, you know, here's the one slide representation of, of what's important in them. Um, so there's this relationship piece, this sort of tree structure of, of how things fit together. Uh, there's whether things are repeatable or not. And then there's requirement types of whether they are mandatory, optional, or conditional elements. Um, so starting with the relationships, this is kind of the, the, the heavy lifting uh, part done for you if you're a developer. So if you are given a metadata schema, the relationships is a real shortcut to go from, uh, I don't really understand what I'm doing to here is a completed database that I can start building with. Um, because those classes basically tell you here are my tables and the relationships between the classes tell you here are the connections between my tables and then the elements are just here's the fields in them. Uh, so you can go really quickly from a schema to that sort of middle picture is called an ERD or an entity relationship diagram where you sort of sketch out a database visually. And then you can go from that to a functioning web form that can interact with that database and, and just understands what fields need to be there. So relationships are a fantastic thing that just cuts a lot of corners when you go to development, it speeds things up. Um, they also start to give some direction about those reusable components, places where you can cut complexity. Uh, and that's in that class piece. So for example, in this, uh, the concept of a responsible party, this sort of light orange uh, class at the top, um, that's something, it's a class that, that appears all over the schema. So that's a place where we sat down and said, okay, that's going to be a reusable element. So you can now create a person on the form and then reuse that person every time you need to, rather than filling out their information every time. Uh, and that was something that was in the schema that we could kind of jump to how do we get that information from the users in a, in a great reusable way. Perfect. You've given us that by giving us this, this structure with, with classes in it. Um, so the only real thing that I tend to be concerned about with these is sometimes there's things that work in a hierarchy in theory, uh, but in practice are really hard to implement. Um, so in this, uh, we had an example of an infinite hierarchy. Um, so there's an operation class where you can describe an operation that's been doing some sort of work. Uh, but in that operation, you can define that it's part of a parent operation. And in that parent operation, it's just an operation. So it can itself define its parent and its parent and its parent up and up and up. Now, this is a real thing. That's like genealogy. This is a phenomenon in the real world, but trying to build a form that will allow you to capture that kind of relationship and to build an interface that will represent it in a, an all meaningful way is an actually really difficult problem. So that's one of those things where in a schema, great. Yeah, you sit down and you think, well, well yeah, that's the best way to just describe the relationship between these elements. But in reality, it doesn't actually work that well. Um, but in general, yeah, relationships, that's your, that's your bread and butter. Those are great from schemas. Um, so repeatable elements. This is where you go from, okay, I know I have these two tables and they're connected to going, is that connection a one-to-one -one or a one-to-many? 
So uh, is this a thing where I'm only going to be able to have one row from this table match up to one row from this one, or where this one row could have a dozen entries? So for example, um, a fish species only has kind of a, a single scientific name, uh, but it might exist in three or four different regions. So that's a one-to-one -one relationship versus a one-to-many. I don't have time to explain all of this, but I'm going to assume most of you have enough of a background that you can probably follow it enough for our purposes. Um, so how does this work? Uh, in the background, you've got that going on. On the front end, you've got to figure out how am I going to collect information that looks like that? And there's sort of two main options that you have, or at least that we pursued in any length. So the first one is uh, the concept of a multi-entry tool. So there's lots of libraries that you can use now that will let you disguise as what appears to be a single field as something that can collect as many pieces of information as you want. So you'll see these all the time for things like keywords or subjects. That's what we use them for here in this example. Um, these can be pretty good. They look nice and sleek. And as they become more widely used, they, they work all right. Um, but they do kind of require instruction. And anything that requires instruction, people can get confused on. That's that complexity piece. They have to wrap their head around how this one works. Um, but that's, you know, not, not a huge deal. Uh, they also take a little bit more complicated sort of validation and, and processing in the, the back end to make sure that the data you're getting out of it is what you expect to get out of it. Uh, for example, on this, we had for a while anything where you entered a keyword that had a comma in it, it was splitting it on that, and we were getting broken keywords. Those sorts of issues can be missed really easily. But that's a valid, valid option for this. Um, another way you can approach it, especially if the thing that's repeatable is sort of a whole class, so it's like quite complicated, is uh, the sort of second example, second picture you can see there with the blue, um, the idea of duplicating an entire section of a form with JavaScript. So on here, if you click the plus button at the top, the sort of green or blue bracketed section is repeated down below and will continue to be repeated and repeated and repeated so that you can fill out as many versions as you, of you want. Um, so this works really well in terms of capturing information, but can lead to a, a very overwhelming form very quickly. And I'm gonna show you an example of that on the next slide. So, <clears throat> excuse me for a second. Oh. Let's take um, a fairly simple example. So a couple of grad students at Dalhousie University uh, attach a few hydrophones to, to kind of a length of bar and they go out to the, the Halifax Harbor and they put it on a buoy and they drop it down into the, the harbor to record sounds. And they leave it for a few hours and they come back and they recalibrate it. They put it down again and they come back at the end of the day and they take it up and they process the data. And when they process the data, they notice, oops, when we put it back in the water, one of those actually lost, uh, lost connection for a couple of seconds. We've lost a bit of data. So that's, that's a pretty straightforward example. That doesn't seem too complicated, right? Uh, so our form, Currently, uh, this is what that's going to end up looking like. And now this is not the entire form. This doesn't go into here's what this data file is called and where you can access it and the rights on none of that. This is just describing that aspect of how this data was collected, just, just that part of the story. Um, and you can see how quickly the form has gotten to the degree where you might look at that and think, I don't know how much I care about giving three grad students credit. <laughs> Uh, and decide not to fill it out because this entire section of the form is optional. There's nothing on that that compels you to fill it out if you don't want to. Um, so repeatable elements are, are definitely unavoidable. That's gonna be part of anything that you're doing, uh, but how to handle those can be something that you need to think about and, and work through to make sure that the form is still gonna be usable at the end of the day. All right, so moving on to those three requirement types. Uh, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I think I'm actually okay, so good. Um, so the first one, mandatory. These are great in some ways uh, and very problematic in some ways. So uh, they're easy to, to implement. Mandatory forms on the interface, I'm sure you're all very familiar with the idea of uh, a bit of form validation. So if you fail to fill in a mandatory form and you go to submit it, it'll take you back to it and go, okay, uh, we're gonna highlight that in red so that you know that these are now mandatory. You didn't provide them, you need to provide them before you can go forward. Um, 
so in the, our example, title and abstract are mandatory elements. We can't accept data that doesn't provide a title and a description of what it is. Um, and if you fail to fill those in, that's what it'll look like on the form when you try to submit it. Um, you could even go a little bit further with required elements, with mandatory elements, um, and require them in the database itself so that even if data was being brought in by another means, whether it was being like manually entered by a database technician or uh, brought in from an API from a third source, even then the database would reject it if that field didn't exist. So that's even a second level if you want to be really, really enforcing that mandatory conception. Um, the other part about mandatory elements that, that I'm thinking about when I see that something's mandatory is that these are things that are gold for search design. If you need to build a search system that's going to pull the data back out, knowing that the thing is for sure going to be there is like the best things you want for searching. Uh, so those are all the good things and things that I'm thinking about. The things I, I start to get a little bit worried about uh, when I see that something is mandatory or the questions that I have are, what if someone's filling it out and they genuinely just do not know what the value is. Um, are they able to continue filling the form? Or can they can they put in something like unknown or not applicable? Or does it need to be like a real value in that field? How do, how do you handle that situation? Um, and the other thing is, is there anywhere we can kind of cut out work for people? Uh, so just because something's mandatory doesn't mean that they have to fill it in if you know what the value is going to be, uh, either because you can kind of work around it or because, uh, you can sort of presume what's probably going to be the value and set a default and then just let them override it if it turns out that, you know, they're one of the fringe cases where it's not. Anywhere where you can set, um, set something and kind of save people work is very appealing. So going through a schema, I hit something that's mandatory. These are the things that I'm thinking about. If I'm going through and I hit something that's marked as, as an optional element, um, I'm knowing, okay, on the form, we're going to have to now distinguish between the mandatory and the optional things in some way. You'll see that that's usually done by either like marking something with say an asterisk or through we've done like more of a visual color difference, the white versus the gray. Um, I'm also thinking about with those that anything optional is of really limited value for search purposes because if you allow people to search in an optional field there may be a result that would be relevant to them but it's not being returned because that field wasn't filled out. Now you can choose to take that risk, but uh, as I, I'm of the camp that any search system should strive to always return a result. So providing an option that you know is likely to, to not have any fields filled out for it is just, is just not the way I would build a search system. Um, concerns that I have in this, they're, they're fairly minor things. If you're using a relational database, uh, if you have a lot of optional fields, it will reserve some space for those fields, even if they're never filled in. So it can kind of increase your size. But, you know, as long as you're not working with massive, massive data sets, that's not a huge deal. Um, the code can get a little bit more complicated because you now need to accommodate that the value may or may not exist. And if there's too many optional fields on, on a form, even if they're sort of grayed out or marked as you don't have to fill this in, it still looks really intimidating. So it can dissuade users from actually going any further. So at the very least sort of hiding those on another tab or, or down the page is a, is a good practice. Um, all right, quickly going through the conditional ones and then we've got one more slide here. So the conditional one, the big thing, there's not a lot of blanket rules I can give. Um, it really comes down to what the condition is Sometimes they're really simple things where you can just say, oh, okay, well, there's a bunch of conditions that make, in our case, a software form look different than a bioacoustic form. So we just made different forms. You can also make responsive forms where if, say, the condition is, um, if the value is Canadian, then they have to provide a, uh, a local address. Then you can say on the field, they select Canada and have the form sort of responsively drop down the section that's now mandatory. Um, noting on that, that really anywhere you've made the form responsive, there's often uh, a need to make the search responsive in the same way. So that can kind of build up your complexity very quickly. Um, on the flip side, if you're working with conditions that are just really, really complicated in and of themselves, there's not a whole lot you can code around it. Um, the first thing you have to do is provide really clear instructions to the, the users themselves. And you can see on the left here how difficult it sometimes is to translate what the schema says into a user-friendly instruction. Um, 
you can write some validation to try and catch the, the cases where you think things might go wrong. And then it's a lot of just hoping that the data you get is what it's supposed to be because people may or may not follow the instructions that you gave them. Um, all right, so coming through all of that, uh, I wanted to kind of put, leave you with uh, the way that I think about these terms as a developer. So if the schema is giving me one of three options that things are mandatory, conditional, or optional, I'm thinking in more refined terms like this. So is something uh, mandatory defaults, which means that the value is predictable, you can pre-fill it in. Is it a true mandatory, which means if they don't know that thing, we don't want the rest of the data. Um, a lot of things will be marked as mandatory, but they often don't mean true mandatory because ultimately that's what that means. Uh, there's a third part that sometimes marks as mandatory, sometimes is conditional, that I would call that mandatory unknown. We would like them to provide it, but if they really don't know, we still want the rest of the data they can put in an, an unknown or a not applicable. Um, for conditional things, usually when you go through, you'll find that they fall into one of two camps. So you can have a one of conditional where it says one of these two things have to be filled out or one of these three things has to be filled out, but not all of them. Uh, or an if then conditional. So if this thing is filled out, then the rest of this becomes mandatory or becomes optional. Uh, and then within the optional ones, you've got, uh, this is maybe the, these are fighting words ones. Um, what I would call sort of your optional compromise ones. These are ones where you can read through the schema and go, ah, they already had a fight about this one. They wanted to make this mandatory and then knew that they couldn't. So it's become optional. Don't fight anymore about that one. Just put it in. Um, there's ones that are sort of what I call optional others, which is they, in the schema, it's sort of built out into multiple fields. But the reality of the likelihood of anyone actually filling those out means that you could probably just make a single like other or notes field and it would work just as well. So you can usually kind of argue for that and it's a lot simpler to, to write. Um, and then what I'm gonna call optional phishing. And these are ones where you'd love to have the data, but you know you're not gonna get it. In, in your heart of hearts, you know it's, it's not going to be submitted. Um, and this is where you kind of start to deprioritize, including that, especially if it's something that is going to be very complicated to build. Um, so I think we're going to go into questions in a minute, um, but I might leave that slide up as the sort of most controversial one or the one that I think anybody might, it might be a good starting point. Um, I guess we don't without Oliver, so I will also be moderating, which is going to be fun when I can. Uh, it does look like there's more, right. one question. Oh yeah, go ahead, kid. Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, so there's only one question in the chat right now, and that is, would a DOI be assigned? Uh, wow, I'm going to have to get context on that. Uh, it was just shot out during the presentation, but Amanda, if you'd be able to provide some context, that'd be great. That might have been about the YouTube channel. The YouTube? Okay. I'm not sure. I'm speculating just based on the context of the chat. Okay. If Amanda wants to provide additional context to the question, happy to answer it if I'm wrong. For submitting data. That was the clarification. I'm still not sure that I'm understanding. Can we, or is it possible for you to unmute? Okay. Um, would a DOI be assigned for submitting data? If he means for submitting data to Meridian, we currently don't mint DOIs at Meridian for metadata. I think, does Ferter oh. mint DOIs? I, I think this is probably back to, yeah, the, those introductory ones about like, we're not a data repository. Um, so the DOI is something that someone who was submitting the form would provide if they have it um, set up online. Like if, if they have made it available where people can just follow a link and access it, then yes, they would submit that. We're not providing it because that's it, we're really not brokering it in that way. Um, but there's also availability of people just have data living on their hard drive. It's not something that is online. Uh, but your instructions of how to get it are just email me and I'll, I'll send you a copy if, if, you know, it seems legit, then that's, that's also something that people can submit. Let me know if that still doesn't answer it.
there was a thank you. And any other questions? All right. I think we're about right. to the time anyway. So I think up next, until I stop sharing, uh, is Dr. Nicholas Bailey. Yes, thank you. Just starting. Okay, so the presentation, this presentation is is a continuation and and, and enlarging uh, of the previous one. And first, I would like to thank the organizer to have invited me because despite databases and big data are more and more trendy, uh, there is a lot of misunderstanding uh, among our, our, our colleagues and it's good that, that uh, webinars like this uh, still happen. Um, so, uh, um, uh, Kim said that uh, I am, among others, uh, the, the assistant curator of the fish collection at the BT Biodiversity Museum, which is a museum, natural history museum in the University of British Columbia. I am also uh, part of the Sea Rounders project that aims at reconstructing uh, fishery uh, catches uh, globally around the, the world. But I am also part of Cuquetics, which is a Philippine NGO that manage a number of information systems, of which the primary one or the original one, which is Fishbase, an information system on all fishes of the world, and I we and. Um, uh, on which I will base the most of my uh, e example. So it's about widening the, the perspective of the technical uh, issues that we heard about. Also, Sarah started to to go uh, a little bit outside the, the technical issues. Uh, uh, so an information system, it's not only about technical issue, but you have to, to take care about the entire uh, framework and, and working and exploitation on, on environment. And it touches social uh, in the sense of sociology of science and, and funding issues. Uh, Fishbase stands for 30 years now, uh, but along the way, we, we, we had to, to make uh, many compromises. Uh, which is what I call pragmatism. Uh, there are things that you want to do and, and things that you can do. And you try always to, to, to make the two converge, but it's not always uh, possible. And, and because of this pragmatism, you, you, you tend to, to go away from any theoretical uh, framework. But, but we are scientists, we develop this database information system in a scientific framework. And sometimes we have to go back to the theory. So just to be sure what we are talking, what is an electronic database, uh, uh, you see the a possible definition uh, I, I give this. Uh, basically, it's much more than a data set because in, in the database and, and a data set and, and, and a spreadsheet, because within the systems that manage the, the database, there are uh, many uh, protocol processes, rules that are in, implemented or already to help you to, to uh, manage uh, uh, your data. But uh, in some way, uh, 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 the first databases were, were these little uh, card boxes. And, and actually, it's how st started Fishbase. Uh, Daniel Poli had accumulated at the end of the 80s uh, about two or 300 uh, uh, species with their uh, gross parameters, death parameters. Uh, other population dynamics parameters that he wanted to use in, in, in fishery models and in fishery management. So 
the, the, the first important thing when you start on an information system is to uh, is to give a, a goal. And, and generally, why, why do we want to store data in database? It's because we, we want to have, we want to be able to analyze and, and, and to report data. And, and for this, we need structured and very, and very often standard uh, uh, data. Um, and, and in reports, I include uh, making uh, uh, documents, uh, making uh, web pages, uh, making applications, and, and, and so on. So the, the, the other uh, 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 we'll say the, the other opposition that that you may you may have is well, do I want to, to put all information on the topic or uh, do we just target uh, uh, some stuff up, up to a point where a, a, a database can be just a, a repository of the data that you have produced uh, in, in your laboratory for the re better reuse and, and for sharing uh, this data. Um, in, in biodiversity, you, you, always, you always have to ask what what I address, and it's all about the the usual question: why, where, when, for whom, about, and so on. Uh, you have a specificity about the, the taxon specimen. Uh, you, you have to ask yourself if you want to sh uh, store data on species or on specimens or sometimes on something intermediary like population stocks for, for fisheries. Uh, so the goal at the start of fish base was exactly that, put, put the, the, the 200 uh, uh, species in a database to share the gross parameters with other fishery man manager. So, it, it, it went up to go quick, quickly to the 3,000, three, uh, 4,000 species that were uh, exploited at that time in the early uh, 90s, late, late 80s, early 90s. But, but this goal, when you, when you plan to have a long-term uh, information system, it, it can evolve and, and it should be left for further evolution. So for instance, in FishBase, what happened uh, five, five years after the start, the, uh, there was the, the rise of the web. And, and basically, the, the, uh, the founder uh, of FishBase, uh, Daniel Poli and Rainer Freus, well, they scratch their head and they say, well, if we have to enter information from publication, various books, well, it's, it's as easy to enter everything than to look specifically for the species uh, that we, we are targeting. So it started like that. At, the, at this, uh, this time, uh, uh, about 27,000 uh, species of fishes were, were described and, and valid. And well, you, you have all this uh, uh, story uh, reported in the uh, fish base manual that is available online. Uh, when, when, when you have your goal, you, you have to ask yourself, well, for whom I, I do it? And ideally, I, I, place, uh, I place the BIS, so the BIS, uh, Biodiversity Information System, as iceberg. In the immersed part of the iceberg, you have raw data, you, you have complex stuff that can be handled only by, by specialists. But you want to export your data, your reports to various end users uh, and where the data is uh, uh, much simpler. Um, so the, 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 the complexity all re resides in the structure of these tables, if we, if we think in terms of a relational model, 
but it also resides in producing this simple, uh, simple uh, views. And sometimes you may decide, well, I, I just want to to do my information for for the end users and and pick up uh, already synthesized data, simplified data, and I, and I don't want to have anything to do to do with with the complexity of the specialized tables. Well, it's it, it's a way to see, but the long term viability of of the emerge part is is lesser than if you input some complexity that people uh, don't see uh, so you have from from the bottom to the top uh, a decrease of a complexity but you have to know that in terms of funding funders always prefer things that can be uh, uh, quickly and easily visible by most of people. So the the, the more you, you go deeper in complexity, the less funds are available, at least on, on the long term. Uh, it, this thing goes e exactly with, well, it, it is in a reverse uh, order goes together with, with this uh, data information knowledge uh, hierarchy that has been uh, decri described several times and under different forms. And it helps you to ask for whom I, 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 I do this. Because as you can see, you, you will not distribute uh, uh, raw data if you want to to help the, the manager uh, of, of natural resources, for instance. And, and there is quite a difficulty here is that sometimes we have the tendency to say, oh, we, we do this database uh, that, uh, that will facilitate the, the management of, of re resources. But the thing is that at the bottom here, there is this management that, that concerns how to transform the, the scientific knowledge in, into political and managerial decision. And, and sometimes we overshoot a, a little bit and it happened to, to fish base in, in a project to, to strengthen the, the fishery management in, in, uh, in, the, in, in the developing countries. At the first mid midterm meeting, uh, manager of this country expected to have a system where they will push a button and it will tell you what are the quota of fishes that you can catch uh, without, uh, uh, without damaging the, the stocks. But, but fish, fish base does not does, uh, do that. And, and, and rather, the idea it was to, to provide to provide these these information that will help the manager to uh, uh, constitute a, a corpus of knowledge on their stock, and 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 with which they, they will go to their uh, uh, decision maker to take the, the the good decision. So it has to be very clear in your head and also uh, for the people you are speaking to, to whom you, you, you want to uh, disseminate that data or knowledge. For sure, we have all the tendency to, to overshoot a little bit because otherwise you have, uh, as I said, less, less funds uh, available, but it's, you have really to take care to uh, how to you play uh, this, uh, this thing. So um, a, a difference, there are various difference, various characteristics that uh, differentiate the, the piece for research and the piece for, for public. I will not uh, uh, detail and also Sarah has uh, touched a number of them. Uh, Especially about the, the, the complexity um, and 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 uh, a number of other uh, things, but 
again, um, one has to be really aware of what it wants uh, to do at, at the beginning. And at the beginning, because funds are limited, you have to clearly establish what will be the balance between having data and having an informatic system. And, and as a characteristic of the earlier uh, uh, biodiversity uh, information system projects is that they push too hard on the informatics uh, uh, on their project. So in a limited, limited time of a funded project, they could develop beautiful systems, but there was no data inside. Uh, and, and so they, they had a, a pilot data set they, they play with, without thinking, well, who will enter the data at the end? And many, many, uh, many projects in the 90s died and the early 20s died out because they, they didn't plan that, that there should be data in their, in their system. So we, we, we have, uh, um, and, and, and also it's related on how you limit the complexity. So, so uh, we have some rules in Fishbase. For instance, if we don't have uh, 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 data for, for more than 100 species, uh, which is already low compared to the 36,000, uh, we don't create a table for that or we don't add a field for that. Uh, uh, rather, we, we have a multi-choice fields and again, we limit them to five, six, rarely seven uh, 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 choices possible to help the encoder not to scratch their head to, to select between 20 or, or 30 possibilities. And we have always this other choice and with a remark field uh, where you can put uh, what it is about for a very few exceptions that otherwise will make your life uh, quite complex and will force you to, to sure develop the, the uh, part of the informatics. Uh, and also, uh, uh, Sarah spoke about the unknown uh, thing. In Fishbase, it has, it has been well and badly managed at the same time. It, it was well managed because in, in many cases, well, knowing the fish, you can, you can say, oh, in most cases, it will be like that. Uh, the experience we have after 30 years, it's extremely complicated to manage uh, these values afterwards because uh, the, 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 the history of, of how it happened is lost and, and, and you, 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 you finish by doubting of the, of the validity of, of the data. So the unknown, unknown thing has to be carefully uh, sought uh, uh, beforehand. And for sure, the limit complexity, it's to limit the, the, the cost for maintenance and data entry and quality control. So to, we have kept the schema of fish base quite simple. Ba basically, you have in the middle all what is about taxonomy and, and references and, and the link between them. And all the other table are quite similarly connected to these to this triplets that are species, stock and reference. I, I don't detail here. For sure, we, we don't show here a number of connections that may happen between the tables, but uh, really uh, fish base is a quite simple thing. The, 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 the counterpart of, of that is, is that you need to repeat some information. And, and in the relational model, you have uh, a process that is called normalization that is in several steps. And the, for avoiding to repeat the same information in different parts of the database, because then when you have to correct something, you have to correct in 
in in in multi uh, 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 in, in many times in different parts of, of, of the database. So we often repeat information in table. Also at the beginning, it was for performance uh, uh, reasons uh, because a joint of the between tables are costly in terms of uh, computer re resources. Uh, to give an example of the complexity, we uh, Kim spoke about the Darwin core. Uh, at the same time, uh, was developed another schema that is called ABCD or Berlin schema, and they made the exercise to normalize completely uh, uh, the, the domain of uh, occurrence data, and they reach the the glorious number of seventeen thousand fields. You can imagine the form that Sarah described with 17,000 fields. So it, it was a pure academic exercise. And, and they finally reduced uh, this to about 700 fields. Still, the Darwin core at the beginning had only 70, 70, uh, uh, 70 fields. Now I think it's 130 or 150. Uh, uh, I, I don't know exactly. Uh, so yes, we published this schema uh, in 2011. Then you have also to think how you will link with other data and, and think in terms of inter interoperability um, and think about the, the data exchange. So what, what we have in FishBase, I, I, see, I cite here only a few, uh, we we have data coming from uh, uh, the uh, catalog of, of fishes, which is the, the taxonomic reference uh, in fishes, and we export data to to worms, the World Register of Marine Species, catalog of life, and we have also uh, um, uh, air package where uh, uh, scientists students can access to the entire database while in the web it's only pre-cooked query that you can only uh, activate something that that we rarely uh, think about at the start of a project is what about upgrades updates extension and so on so we moved from a, a world in the in the 80s where a software was developed in, in one language, uh, and where today uh, any uh, any simple application uses multiple components and language, each with an independent life. So when you upgrade one component, you have to test all the other components that are connected to that one, and and it has to be thought beforehand how you will pay this because it's usually costly demanding and and to give an example with fishbase we we stand with the access version of 2003 and it's only now now that we move to the 2019 version and it's very very painful because many things uh, have to be changed. We have that in Cirondas as well, where we run on Postgres version nine that will not be supported anymore. And uh, because of that, uh, the Amazon cloud where, where uh, the Cirondas project database is, as, as will shut down completely the, the version nine in, in uh, two or three weeks uh, from now. So we had quickly to react to uh, and, and, and to dedicate time and money uh, to move to a new version. Uh, so ideally a funding solution would be to have a, a, a maintenance basal, basal recurrent fund and to develop extension of, of the of the project uh, uh, only on on funded project basis, which will have also an impact on on the recurrent fund. It is, to my knowledge, rarely uh, uh, rich. At least in Fishbase, 
we still don't have a, a maintenance basal uh, recurrent fund and everything is managed upon the project basis so which leads that that you also have quickly to establish a strategy uh, if you want to keep your your information system on the long term and and basically the best way to have a long term goal is to split it in short term targets short term projects with well delimited achievable marketable uh, 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 deliverables things that you can sell and show oh i i had this success please give me more money to to continue uh there is a problem of the quality versus quantity uh, that sarah showed already in fish base we always have discussion during the meetings because some people say there are too many errors in fish base some say oh if we have 20 percent of of uh, of errors it doesn't matter because we uh, uh, we 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 can manage that uh, okay so it depends on on, on the goal of, of, the, of the data always and also how to deal with the mistakes that are in the source of data and it is different of the mistakes that are, uh, that happen during the data entry so how much quality control do you want to to to, to do that that's a, that's a problem because entering data creates things quickly while quality control uh, uh, produce quality stuff but at a very low pace and also how to deal with missing information in fish base we have some estimations and and we try to put that at the bottom of the species page because it's models and and other estimations well we did well usually but we, we do it bad with uh, aqua maps that we have at, at the head of the page uh, which has created a, a lot of problem uh, uh, a colleague in, in, in france uh, manage a small database and he, he exposes here very well how he managed the, the raw data versus the, the estimations that he did uh, with those and uh, well i think i'm a, a little bit late uh so all the rest is about the sociology of science uh do you want to do the database yourself have you a team have you an institution support uh, from local to international would you like to accept any uh, uh contribution it's, it, having this like let's say i naturalist it creates a, a number of issues in terms of quality control, uh, speed of that entry, and, and so on. And in fish base, uh, up to now, we usually prefer that people send their their PDF or their dataset, and we enter uh, ourselves. But we are sometimes slow to do it, and it it's all about. Uh, 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 a well-known uh, picture uh, describing uh, the, the working to, together. Uh, you have the staff IT context, you know, do you have your own IT people or do you have to, to ask for uh, uh, IT support from your department? Uh, Sarah said it's not always easy to work with, uh, with IT people especially and to communicate with, with them especially when they are in university because it's not in their agenda to produce software their agenda is to elaborate algorithms that that can uh, solve a uh, different problem in, in different domain so they don't really care to to produce a finalized uh, software uh, you have to take care about that um, also in fish base we we have people since the, one or two people that are here for 30 years a number of others that are there for 25 to 20 years so it's about how to propose a long-term perspective in terms of career of or, or, of your it people or you uh, encoder and it's 
a little bit worse for the for the researchers and the uh, academics because how the database work is recognized usually it is not it, it's only through publications that you can derive for the database but it's very difficult to produce high quality paper and and taking care about the database at the same time and and you have the social context in uh, research and and it is something like epistemology versus sociology of science so what is the quality who judges the quality of your uh, of your information system and is the funding dependent on quality and related to that the same question with success so you you have to be aware of, of, of that to to prepare yourself to uh, answer this question uh, to again continue to have fun to continue your system so as i said uh, sometimes you you have to go back to the theory uh, fish base he, he, he is mainly based on on the taxonomy that is changing every day and it's very difficult to to update so uh, uh we, we we as i said we have kept the thing simple but now we realize then updating data especially when a species is split in two is very difficult and the theory of that exists for 25 years but we have not implemented it yet so i will not detail but basically you know we we will come from from a schema like this that is still readable to something like that that is quite complex do we want to go there i i, I don't know yet but but it may help a lot in in the end to update uh, data so the, 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 it was the entry for the synonyms uh, 20 years ago and it now moved to that because we have started slowly to implement without disturbing the, the good uh, running of the database where you see that already the form became more complex and most of uh, a big part of this data are just for quality control uh, for uh, monitoring things and that are not shown at all on on, on the web so from a structure like that we expect to go like that and and to have only one link uh, that manage uh, all the, the synonyms and the reference uh, instead of, of three conclusion uh, well you have to balance between best practices and uh, and pragmatism or always and to keep your your information system adaptable but sometimes you have to go back to theory it, it requires a constant monitoring and a, a, a evaluation um, and also the environment change people technologies theories funding fun, uh, opportunity of funding and and basically you, you have to manage your information system like, like a company really so thank you um, here, here is uh, some of our founders uh, some of the team in uh, in the philippines and uh, maraming salamat po it means thank you Elfaristopoli in greece merci in french and we always have to remember that what we are talking about it's beautiful uh, things uh, like this or like this uh, sea slug thank you Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, if there's one question, we can take one question before the break. Alrighty, if there's no questions to be had, we're a couple minutes behind schedule. So we'll just take a five minute break instead of a 10 minute break. Um, we'll resume the session at 15 minutes past the hour or 4.15 AST. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to be so long. <laughs> no worries. Is everybody back at this time? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. 
I'm around. Alrighty, so I think we have all our panelists, so we can begin. Um, I just wanted to start introducing our panelists. First, we will have uh, Kelly Stathis, Nicholas Bailey, Kim Mortimer, and Sarah Vella to answer a couple of your questions. Um, are there any questions to start us off? You can either ask questions by unmuting or using the chat. I see no questions at this time. So we have a couple of questions in the background. Um, one of the questions here is, how do you define success? That's open to all panelists. Yeah, that one's... Do we want to clarify first? I think this was something that, that Dr. Bailey had referenced in his presentation about um, uh, sort of setting goals and and how do you know when you're done? How do you know when you're heading in the right direction? Um, yes. And sort of, yeah, so how do you, what is it that you're measuring? How do you know if it's going well? And whether that's in terms of um, like how much data you're collecting? Is it the number of people who are using the data? Is it something that even, does anyone have those sorts of metrics set up for their project perhaps? Well, I, I I can give you some some further insight on on what happened once in uh, to to Fishbase uh, uh, about that. As I said, uh, Fishbase started to help the fishery managers, especially the ones in in developing country, be, because these guys at that time have, and even now have hard time to access to the scientific literature and mainly because it's a high cost for them that they cannot uh, afford. So the idea was to synthesize a number of, of information on fisheries uh, to be distributed uh, to them. Actually, FishBase started to be distributed on, on floppy disk, uh, three, three inches and, and a quarter. Um, so we receive money because of that. But when the web appeared, you know, as I said, the, the goals shifted a little bit. They, they, not, they, they did not shift, actually. But uh, we had an additional goal that was oriented to, to public at large. So uh, we collected statistics on our website and uh, we, sh we showed Obviously, that that the, the the access to to fish base was growing incre incredibly, and then ten years later, we were auditioned by the guys who gave us money for fishery management, and they asked us, "Now show me that your uh, system has helped uh, fishery managers." And then we are we had hard time because all that we had were statistics on the web and, and it was mainly public at large. And over uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people who used FishBase at that time, there were nearly uh, uh, 200 fishery manager uh, using, uh, using FishBase. So that was a problem and uh, the result was that two years after we had no more funds uh, from this donor. So uh, uh, I think there is no, no magic uh, recipe, but you, you have to harden yourself and, and establish yourself, your, your own uh, uh, system, but you have to take into account the provenance of your funds and, and discuss also with your donor what what will we will consider as a success. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think some of it depends on your mission statement and your definition of your project, um, which in turn mm -hmm. should define some of your metrics, right? Like, is it use? Is it 
amount of money you've made? Is it proving that you've helped so many researchers? Is it publishing papers? I mean, I think the the like ten million dollar answer is <laughs> we're done when I can retire, but you know, um, we're done when we can stop touching it, when we can stop playing with it. But there will always be people who want to change things, so it'll never stop on that level. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, I mean, just to echo some of that, it depends on the project. Um, but for further we are looking at how getting as much coverage of different Canadian data repositories as possible. So the number of repositories harvested is a big metric for us. Um, and then also kind of just the breadth of our connections to other aggregators. Like we just got the open air um, one set up and data citation index using it as a way to help these smaller repositories be exposed to other aggregators. Um, and we're working on other metrics, for example, tracking the traffic that we're driving. Right now we don't have a way to track those clicks to other data sets, um, but that's something we're hoping to develop with the new interface. So yeah, number of repositories and hopefully usage in the future. Thank you. All right. Okay, to move on to the next question. Yeah. Perfect. All righty. And the next question on my list is, how do you get users to provide metadata? This is one I'm particularly interested in. Anyone want to start us off? Kim? Yeah, I mean, that's what Brady is struggling with right now is how do we get users? We've done webinars and presentations and posters and papers and talk to people. Mm -hmm. And at some point we're kind of, <laughs> at what point do we say we've done enough and wait or do we have to keep reaching out? Um, Like we're reaching out to people and that is sort of the the plan for the time being. But it's likely that at some point you'll start getting um, sustainable growth through word of mouth. You make it popular enough that other people tell other people about their system um, and so on and so forth. But how you get to that point is, is a little uh, complicated. Right. I also think just like um, at a higher level, I feel like there's a theory, like how do you get people to submit data? You either use a carrot or a stick. So if you're in a position where you can hold something over them, like you are their employer or you are the government, or there's some sort of like legitimate way you can make someone fill out a form, then that's easy enough. But if you're not in a position where you can do that, then you kind of have to go with that carrot model and whether you do it by making the data collection so seamless that no one realizes it's happening, which is something you see a lot in like social media. So like Facebook and, and Twitter and stuff, you don't realize the data that you're giving them as you're giving it. Mm -hmm. Because as far as you're concerned, you're just like playing a game or communicating with your friends. Um, and then of course you get into a lot of data privacy concerns around that because how did you consent if you didn't know? But uh, let's set that aside. I th the other ways you can do it are in terms of making it clear to them that the, they're going to see value for the time they put into submitting that data. Um, so I think in terms of our tool, what we're hoping is people who have that sort of data to share innately see the value of them then coming back to the tool to search it to find data that other people are sharing for their own research. Uh, but that sort of requires getting enough of a pool started. So there's sort of a, a you know central mass or, or whatever that phrase is critical mass that you need to hit before you can start kind of building on it. Uh, and how you get that is I think a more complicated question, especially if you have very limited resources to do it with. Thank you. Any additional answers before we, Kelly? Yeah, so for further, it's a bit different um, because we're not dealing with the individual users submitting data, we're working with repository managers. Um, and we do always sort of do that outreach and ask, even if it's a totally open license, open data, because they want to make that connection. Um, so basically we're having to get them to provide metadata in any sort of machine readable format. So usually they already have an API or some sort of feed, but if they don't and we're particularly interested, we'll work with them to figure out how they can get that set up. Awesome, thank you. Nicholas, did you have any comment before we move on? 
No, no, it's okay for me. Really? Uh, another question here is, do you see foresee any major changes to the work in the near future? Or the projects that you're working on? Always hoping that um, the Tri-Council agency is going to start enforcing their data management policy and we'll see some change that way, but also I don't know how they would enforce it, so. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I completely agree with Kim. Uh, I mentioned that uh, about the recognition of the databasing work for, for researcher. It's, I think it's a major issue and, and uh, what it's a bot bottleneck uh, actually because yes you can hire uh, people to encode data but when when it is very simple data it's okay when it is about data like for biodiversity where you have to know the geography, the taxonomy, uh, uh, one particular domain, is it growth or, 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 or stock management? Okay, we standardize data, but it's not as simple as it seems because for each field, you have some kind of con uh, convention that are Progressive, progressively established when you build the, the, the database. And, and, and this might be uh, very complex in, in the end. Uh, for us, uh, it requires one month to, 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 to train a, a complete data on Condor. When I say complete, when it can touch more or less all tables and and, and, and the, the, the researcher in the end are, are the ones that can have the last say in terms of quality control. But it's time consuming. It doesn't produce publication. So they don't have time to do it. And, 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 and it's not about the quantity uh, for them. It's about uh, increasing the quality of, of, of the data set. So, uh, there is definitely a major effort uh, in institutions, universities, uh, government to strengthen their, their uh, data policies. Um, yeah, so for further, um, the main change for the discovery service will probably be the interface changes that I mentioned. So we're currently working on gathering feedback from users and working to incorporate that into a redesign that does have the text and geospatial search more side by side. Um, and we're also, well, for the repository service that is launching very soon. So we're anticipating more users to that. And again, um, with the tri-agency policy, hopefully coming down the line, it will be a good resource for that. Sarah, any comment before we move on? Uh, I don't really know what I can add beyond what Kim said uh, as we're transitioning from sort of being in building to waiting for feedback. That's great, thank you. Alrighty, so we'll move on to one final question before we wrap up, unless there's another question from the audience. Alrighty, uh, what do you do about bad metadata? Generally, the process is reactionary in that you only figure out that the metadata is bad after someone else tells you, and then you go and fix it, mm -hmm. um, which might mean either you just get rid of it and say, I don't want to fix it right now. I'll, let, I'll get someone else to do it and hide it. You go to the person who gave you the metadata and say, this is wrong, fix it, or you try and fix it yourself. Um, there's really no real way to automate it or make it easier beyond just, yeah, you have to read through the paper, paper, the metadata, whatever the source is, figure out what's wrong. Ideally, the person who has identified the problem will tell you, but yeah, it's a manner of going through and manually changing it. 
and if it gets really bad, uh, <laughs> going to the people who uh, delivered it to you and saying, please stop giving us metadata until you fix this problem. <laughs> Any further comment? Yes, uh, again, I, I, I touch on you a little bit uh, about management of errors, but it's very, very tricky. Uh, I, I remember uh, a presentation by the uh, communication officer uh, or, or the one who, who, who became uh, a communication officer of JBIF the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And it was before the, the GBIF existed. And she said basically, oh, now that we have the web, let's put everything that we have on diversity. We don't care about the quality because people will react and we will we'll point out the mistakes, uh, as Kim said, and, and we will correct. But it never happened. And, and JBIF never succeeded to, to, to make the provider correct their own mistakes because it takes time. Uh, it's not that easy. And even, you know, when, when I, I, I consult some website, I see one, one mistake. Well, it takes time to write a message on the mistake so that the the people of the database can understand what I mean. And, and well, you immediately take 10 minutes, 15 minutes, just to write a, a proper e email to facilitate their life. So you do it once, you do it twice, and after you stop because, because you, you, you spend your life sending a report a, a error to, to database. So I, I think, again, it's a pragmatic solution. Uh, um, mainly in fish base, uh, we do like Kim described. We, we wait that, that people are really pissed off uh, with the mistakes that we disseminate. Uh, and also we conduct regularly campaign of, of quality control, table by table, field by field, but again, to to, to make the correction, sometimes it takes hours. So, so you give you give up the most difficult one. Thank you, Kelly. Did you have something to add? Sure. Um, I guess just for further, since we we actually aren't curating any of the harvest and metadata, we're taking it as is. Um, we don't do a lot about bad metadata, um, and for that reason, I think having overall like consistent good metadata is a major part of our criteria for harvesting. So. If we're looking at a repository and we're seeing it's totally all over the place, we might not reach out to them at that point. Um, and if there's some individual data sets within a repository that we harvest that are missing a key element, say title, they just won't show up in the further discovery service, they'll be excluded. Thank you. Any additional comment before we wrap up? All righty. Well, thank you everybody for joining today and thank you you to Kim, Kelly, Nicholas, and Sarah for presenting. Very informative presentations. And um, we have our next event on the 27th. Uh, I will send a link to that soon. Um, and I, we hope to see you there. Thank you so much for coming today. <laughs>